he's like, it's while he's talking about this, and then he won't like consider this on the grounds of NATO and how like NATO has played a key role in what he's talking about here. War used to be simpler. Violent, yes, always violent, but more straightforward. It used to be about large groups of men fighting with their muscles, their spears, and eventually their swords and their crossbows, and then their guns and their cannons. But then we hit a point where it just started to change so quickly, faster and faster until Eventually we got this, private corporations who make unfathomably powerful Why does bro look like he's doing better help? ...full death machines and then ship those weapons to every corner of the globe. I once heard about these guys who would make weapons and sell them 150 years ago, sell them to anyone who would buy them. These were industrial weapons. And sometimes they were sold to the opposite sides of really big rivalries, conflicts. I heard these guys started World War I, though I'm skeptical of that. This is something I've wanted to understand forever. The arms trade. As a student of conflict, it's something... As a student of conflict. Oh my god, he is so... He's such a fucking cornball, dude. I just... Oh, I can't stand it when he says stuff like this. I love it so much. I can't stand it, but I love it at the same time. And I feel like I have to understand. And I recently found a way to better understand it. In an old bookstore in Portland, Oregon, I found a book that has changed my perspective on this. Bro, you cannot do track shots. That's crazy. It's called Merchants of Death. And it is surprisingly relevant to today, even though it was written in 1934. This book has been the center of... He should be reading Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, bro. Something Morgan. I've been thinking about and studying. Why do countries, especially the United States, make and sell weapons to every corner of the globe? That's what we're going to get to the bottom of. Yeah. War is a ragged, Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. There's like better... I mean, there's good books out there. And it all starts with this book. He needs to read the room. So I'll start with planting seeds. Just emailing experts. Uh, we're trying to map arms trade. Data is a huge part of this. Like I want to make a map. I want to see it visually. And there's not a lot of clear maps out there. Fucking so we're going to make our own. But that's not easy. Look at my beautiful art here. Talk to the team. Loop them in. Let them know what we're up to. Testing one, two, three, four, five. Big lines coming out of either side. How big is this motherfucker's team now? What the fuck? Oh god, I don't know what I'm doing here. Alright, let's put the mapping aside for a little bit. Turn back to this book. Bro, he's been reading so hard, he he had a, he has a cut on his finger, okay? This book is what hooked me on this topic, and there's a lot here. Approximately the size of the CIA. Okay. Videos like this take a really long time to make, and um, there's a lot of really creative, amazing, talented people who work on them. The, the ability ad. for us to Obviously. do this deep dive data journalism um, is made possible because of sponsors. Media is always made possible because of sponsors, and um, this is the part of the video where I'm going to thank today's sponsor, who is BetterHelp. Longtime viewers of this channel know that um, in addition to talking about international relations, I... I'm also a big fan of therapy. Um, I got into therapy a few years ago, and ah! it really sort of changed my whole outlook on life. Oh, I didn't go to therapy because I had some clinical diagnosis like depression or anxiety. I went because I was struggling just in my mind with a lot of different things. And therapy turned into this like place where I could learn how my mind works 
what is this video is sponsored by the cia bro happening in my mind why it's happening BetterHelp is a platform that makes therapy more accessible it's online you sign up you tell the app a little bit about yourself and what you're struggling with and then it matches you with somebody in their network a licensed therapist they've got like tens of thousands of licensed therapists in their network they match you with the best one you can choose to communicate with your therapist over the phone i love when people go better help as a zion is up it's like i know yes but also it's like bad even if it wasn't like it could have been a fucking <laughs> it, it it literally could have been something else and it still would be bad which is what i do i do my therapy while i'm like walking around in the forest or you can do it just as messages if you don't want to talk to anyone or you can do it as a video call if your therapist isn't a good fit you can use the app to find a new one ultimately better help's goal is to make therapy more accessible to all of us i believe that in 20, 30 years, therapy will be seen as the same way that we see exercise today. Something that we used to think was not necessary, but now we realize is actually incredibly necessary for our mental health. If you want to check this out, there's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com slash Johnny Harris. You get 10% off your first month. Clicking the link helps support the channel. What did you say design is off? How long? They literally worked with the IDF after October 7. And not only that, but also I'm I think wasn't it like created one of the founders is like a IDF guy or something. BetterHelp was like, yeah, we're we're helping uh we're helping Israelis for free or something. Let's see. Like I said, it still doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's owned by the IDF directly. <laughs> it's still bad regardless. And it also gets you in on this discount. Thank you, BetterHelp, for supporting the video. Um, I'm going to dive back into this long journey of figuring out what's going on with weapons and the United States government. Here we go. <clears throat> Our starting place is that point in history where war dramatically changed. Instead of large groups of men fighting with handheld tools, war became much more about fighting with machines, bigger and bigger. This was made possible by the massive amounts of energy that were found stored in coal and oil. Now, warships could be pushed by steam instead of wind shielded by iron instead of wood. Armies and supplies could be brought to the battlefield on trains, out with the horses and in with the trucks. It's the late 1800s and the fires are burning hotter than ever. Metal is taking the shape of souped up cannons and guns and ships, tools of war that were never thought possible, now flowing in abundance. Arms makers engineer war scares. They excite government. There ain't no way he actually highlights like this. Come on, bro. Governments and peoples to fear their neighbors and rivals so that they can sell more armaments. The simple, relatively inexpensive weapons of earlier ages were displaced by highly scientific death machines. And the cost of these, together with the upkeep of huge armies, brought a rapid increase in national war budgets. So that's when it happened. And overseeing all of this, this production of industrial weaponry, not governments, but businessmen. He's just reading the shit out of this book, huh? Always. But the arms merchant doesn't see himself as a villain. According to his lights, he is simply a businessman who sells his wares under prevailing business practices. The uses of which his products are put, and the results of his traffic, are apparently no concern of his. No more than they are, for instance, to an automobile salesman. This is crazy, bro. Like, getting one of the dudes in your fucking team to film you as you're, like, casually reading the book. He's, he's upgraded. He's upgraded a lot. Okay? Is he doing a video on a book report? Man, it don't matter. Look at this 11 hours and 300,000 views, baby. Still haven't heard back from a lot of experts and still just kind of intimidated by this. Fair, all the other YouTubers copied his style. Yeah, I mean, he is the Vox guy. Well, him and his editors. This data set. 
One British arms manufacturer compared his enterprise to that of a house furnishing company, which went so far as to encourage matrimony to stimulate more purchases of house furnishings. The arms maker felt that he too was justified in promoting his own particular brand of business. Hey Stephen, uh, happy new year to you. I'm curious if you can help us crunch this data. Would love your thoughts and we'll go from there. The arms industry is undeniably a menace to peace, but it is an industry to which our present civilization clings and for which it is. He's, that's like, he's like, that's important. Like clinging. Shadow shitting on Johnny for being the last one here to realize what he's talking about in this video. Like they weren't also once that guy. No, I, 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 I love Johnny Harris. As you guys know, he is a, he is my former Mormon King. He's just, it's great. It's just, I mean, even when it's corny, I like it. It's just great. Is responsible. CIPRI is this organization that shows all of the weapons being transferred from every country to every other country. So here's ChatGPT's initial take on the data set. It's really disheartening how horrible it all looks at first. So these lines are telling me nothing, and you know that at some point it will get into a pretty place, but um, it's not there, not even close. Bro, he's wearing my chain. First up, Hiram Maxim, world famous as the inventor of the wholesale killing machine, a type of machine gun. Maxim invented this gun that could fire 660. This shit is like regarded as the reason why Africa was uh, was was devastated and, and colonized. Six rounds per minute. That was very what he's fast. Say. And crucially, it didn't jam like most machine guns. With his amazing invention, Maxim takes his gun out on the road all over the world to try to pitch it to different governments. He's in South Africa and France and Switzerland and Italy and Germany. His gun selling missionary efforts eventually take him to Russia, where he was almost thrown out for looking like a foreign Jew. Man, that's <laughs> like, kind of aggressive. But then eventually he was able to stay and show them his gun, but they were skeptical. They're like, no gun can shoot 666 rounds a minute. Yo, yo, Russia is crazy, dude. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> they bro, <laughs> bro <laughs> Russia is a in, that's a certified Russia moment right there, Russian Empire moment. <laughs> but and they were incredibly impressed. His fame became so great in Russia that the Tsar invited him to visit him, which he did. He was also decorated with other Russian orders. The British eventually start using Maxim's gun in their big adventures in Africa. They were taking over modern day Sudan and started using this gun against the locals who were fighting with swords. The British newspaper giddily reported that when the Maxim gun was turned on the Arabs, quote, a visible wave of death swept over the advancing hosts. Much like the top of the hour ad break where a visible wave of three minutes of ads sweep over those who are unsubscribed. So don't be like those devoid of a Maxim gun. Shoot the top of the hour ad break with your subscriptions as though you have unlimited, uh, unheating, long-barreled Maxim guns. Um, I think. I don't fucking I'm trying. Fuck you. Fuck you, chat. Here's the minute ad break. In most of our wars, it has been the dash, the skill, the bravery of our officers and the men that has won the day. But in this case, the battle was won by a quiet, scientific gentleman living down in Kent. Yeah, this book is so good. War was changing and Maxim was on the front lines of it and he was making a sh ton of money in the process. China hears about the Maxim gun and immediately sends someone to go check it out. The Chinese representative gets to the UK and the first words as he stepped off the ship on English soil were, 
I should like to see Hiram Maxim. The Danes passed on the gun, the king himself saying that it would, quote, bankrupt my little kingdom in about two hours. But the king of Persia, the Shah, wanted some of these guns. So he asked the Prince of Wales to gift him some. And this is a key moment. The Prince of Wales says that he actually is not authorized to give the king of Persia any of these guns because they belong to Hiram Maxim's corporation. Pause here for a second. Do you see how this works back in the late 1800s and early 1900s? Governments couldn't sell weapons. It was the corporations that sold the weapons. They were the ones who were in charge. It was a free market of weapons. And the weapons kept flowing to everyone on earth. And these guys kept on making a lot of money. Which gets us to our next character in the story, our next merchant of death. Basil Saharoff a.k.a. the super salesman of death, a.k.a. the mystery man of Europe, because he was, quote, a shadowy figure. This guy has an insane story, and someone should make a movie about him because his story is wild, but he was the super salesman of death. He went around Europe and around the world selling guns and submarines and all manner of weapons to anyone who would purchase them including two sides of the same war. Like Greece and Turkey, which was the Ottoman Empire at the time, were definitely like arch rivals and they would sort of break out into conflict at any moment. Zahara first goes to Greece and sells them some outdated submarines that the great powers didn't want to buy. And then goes right to Turkey and says, hey, Greece just bought a bunch of submarines. You need some too. And they buy some submarines. And then he goes to Russia and does the same thing. Hey, Greece and Turkey have these submarines. They're in the Black Sea. You probably need some. And indeed, Russia bought one because of that. And this guy's commissions go through the roof. It was rumored that Zaharov became one of the richest men on earth because of the arms trade. Luckily, I have very skilled map friends that are gonna help me make this data look pretty, including Marcus. Hey Johnny, this is a multi-level problem, so I'm gonna try to break it down. Who invented the mapping tool that we use called GeoLayers. So I've transformed your data and uh, I have imported. Okay, so this is the guy who's responsible for every fucking YouTube page. This is, the, we found it. We found the source of the problem. He's the, he's the number one map guy. He's the one who's been, he is basically the death dealer dog, but for maps. That's crazy. Ported it here. And right now we can create a data driven style. Dude, everything I know about, everything I know about map porn says to me that this Dutch man on the other side of the line probably fucking despises me with every fiber of his being. I'm the most anti-map guy. I'm the most anti-map guy on the planet. Almost all the positions, with the exception of like urbanism, uh, I, I am on the other side on. I can, I, dude, he is probably such a NATO guy. Oh my God. So you have all these international businessmen that were making lots of money off of this new demand for industrial weapons. The Krupp family and their steel, the DuPont family and their gunpowder, Remington making guns, and of course, Alfred Nobel, the dynamite king, who did go on to repent for his sins by creating a peace prize in his name. Peace, brought to you by... You say this stuff and then end up being a fan? Well, if you are a fan, I'm sorry. What do you mean, urbanists despise you? Urbanists despise me even though we agree. Like, I love walkable cities and public transit. I have the exact same public transit autism that they do. So, like, I don't really give a shit if they despise me or not. There's some urbanists who like me too, by the way. That's not true. Killing machines. The paradox of the heart of international relations and the theme throughout this entire video. These men got richer and richer. The weapons got better and better until one day it all blew up. The number and variety of death machines had never been equaled. All of the sinister engines of war invented and perfected in the previous half century were used in the fighting. And naturally enough, there was further development of these during the war itself. The machine gun was improved. 
artillery was motorized and its range became longer. Sights and fire control apparatus became more scientific and more accurate. Many new implements of war were invented. The tank, a combined American and French invention, was first used by the British. Hand grenades were supplied in the trenches, and rifle grenades increased the range of these deadly missiles. The First World War took place between 1914 and 1918, and thanks to all these new deadly chemicals and weapons, it was easily the deadliest conflict that the world had ever seen. Tens of millions of people killed or wounded. It was after this war that the world woke up. Yeah, that's actually a funny take. Fed haired Shank says, it only became a tragedy once Europeans started using it on themselves. Kind of hard to, kind of hard not to notice that when he, he glanced over some of the most devastating aspects of colonialism that could only happen due to the superiority of these like advanced murder machines. When he made it seem like that was just an adventure, <laughs> only to turn around and be like the worst, most devastating tragedy of all time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand <laughs> once they started doing to each other what they were doing to like people in africa oh man shit was really fucked up and realized that making weapons a free market to be sold to the highest bidder was probably a bad idea and that's when this book came out in the 1930s it was a part of a larger discussion and critique of the international arms trade. Some of these critiques went so far as to say that it was the arms makers themselves that exacerbated tensions between countries and caused the war. Though most historians just say that the arms trade actually just exacerbated the violence by putting more weapons into the system. But then in the conclusion of this book, you have this kind of prophecy moment. The future may very well bring fiercer and more destructive wars and increased business for the arms makers. If war continues, it is not at all fantastic to predict that the arms merchants will grow increasingly important. Already the stage of national affairs has been reached where the largest item on national budgets is for past and future wars. Already war appears the greatest and most important activity of government. The economic consequences of this new nationalistic militarism will soon be apparent in the arms industry. This new nationalistic militarism. It was new back then, it's not new anymore. But this is where it started. So now it's time to fast forward and see how right they were. All right, this is for MJ. This is the pass off for you to make a beautiful map. Okay, so John just sent me over the direction for the next map. This one is a bit complicated. I think I finally have a good map update to show you. Today, the United States is the global superpower and the country who exports more weapons than any other country and by a long shot. And this is what we've been working to try to map. All this data hunting and trial and error is to try to see what this looks like. Today, private companies still make and sell the weapons, but unlike in the Merchants of Death era, weapon sales go through a government approval process, which means that weapons are no longer just a product that make money for businessmen. Instead, they are a currency that countries use to purchase influence. In this case, the United States being okay. the top country. Okay. Thanks okay. mostly to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, or CIPRI, we know where these weapons come from and where they go. This has been the bedrock of our data hunting, and I'm happy to say that after a fairly long process, we have mapped this. So let me show you what it looks like when the global superpower uses weapons as a currency for influence around the globe. It's wild that he's like, it's wild that he's talking about this. And then he won't like consider this on the grounds of NATO and how like NATO has played a key role in what he's talking about here. This map is pretty beautiful and I'm really grateful for the team that helped me make it. Um, I've got a great team. And 
It's helpful for seeing one really important thing, which is the expanse of U.S. arms trade, how far it goes, how wide it goes. The thicker the lines, the more weapons flow. But this map What do U.S. weapons buy? Regional stability, alliance, friendship, counter an enemy, vital resource. Yeah, he's not going to fucking link this back to NATO. Map only shows us the first layer. In reporting this story, I've realized that there's a deeper way to understand this map. And it's going to take a little extra reporting, which is why there's going to be a part two of this video, which dives into the modern arms trade, what it looks like when the U.S. sells weapons all over the world and why they do it. The purpose of this video was to introduce you to the merchants of death so that they could teach us about how the business of war came to be and what happens when that business goes too far. Part two will be coming out really soon. And in part two- Bro, please tell me, bro, imagine he just fucking starts talking about, I realize he gives himself so much credit. That's probably what it is. Yeah, he like, he basically will like explain a story as though he's the first to have ever come across this piece of information that's like prior. That, I think, is part of what makes it, like, kind of cringe. We're going to talk to arms trade experts, as well as get some help from my new colleague, Sam Ellis, the creator of our new channel, Search Party, all with the hope of drilling deeper into this map to understand why the United States sells weapons to over 100 countries and what effect that has on conflict in this world. So stay tuned for our next video, which will be part two of the arms trade. And thanks for watching. Let me guess, his part two is going to be about how obviously we have to do this because Russia and China. Right? That's what he's going to say. Part two is going to be like the Cold War and why we had to fucking arm the Contras. <laughs> We're watching today. I found very interesting stuff about Joseph Smith on this episode of Fear End that I did not know about.